Hey everyone, it's Dan from The Plague. Welcome to another episode of Hidden Gems. This is the show where we take a look at albums from the past that we feel have maybe um, been underrated and underappreciated and try to shine a little spotlight on them. Uh, joining me again is Nels, and he's going to start us off this week. Yeah, so uh, this week, unfortunately, I don't have a prop to show you. I could not find my... I'm pretty sure I have it on CD. I do not have it on cassette. <laughs> Um, I'm going with uh, Soldier of Fortune by Loudness. Um, it's their uh, 1989 release. I think it's either their eighth or ninth studio album. But it was their first album with um, with uh, Mike Vesera, I think is how his name is pronounced, the uh, uh, an American singer, a guy who has done just an amazing amount of side projects and other things. But yeah, I think this was um, sort of Loudness's... Um, sort of their ongoing attempt to break into the Western markets in a, in a bigger way, which kind of boggles my mind because it seems like they were fairly ubiquitous at that point in English and American metal press anyway. Yeah. But yeah, they seem to really uh, want to, to break into that market more. And, and uh, yeah, adding a, an American singer, I think was an attempt to do that. Um and I remember back in the day thinking, oh, well, that's kind of lame that they're getting an American singer. And it seemed it seemed kind of um, transparent to me. And he didn't seem like the best singer to me. And I remember kind of, I, I think I liked the album, but I didn't really pay that much attention to it. Um, and it, and reading up on it, it, it didn't even, that album didn't even chart in the U.S., which is kind of hard to believe. Um but in recent years, I have gained a much, much better appreciation for it. Um, and while, um, you know, I would probably rather uh, hear the original singer, um, I really like Mike's voice. I think it works extremely well with this material. Uh, and the material in, that is on, on display here is just like classic, classic loudness, you know, um, the riffs it's you you will recognize who the band is who the guitar player is right away on like 80 percent of the riffs sound so loudness you know and 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 as far as um you know akira's guitar playing there's just soloing throughout um just it's it's really excellent um guitar playing everything that you probably like about loudness if you like loudness is right here you know um it, it's to me, it's it's become one of my favorite <laughs> albums to listen to. Um, yeah, and reading up on Mike, uh, he had, he was in a band called Obsession before this. Um, I, when I I vaguely remember their Martial Law album, um, but they did like three or four albums, and then he went on to be in just a ton of other bands. He played with Ingve, and he's done production for a, a bunch of other bands. Um, but yeah, this album, uh, it's just it's really there's some extremely heavy stuff the stuff you you know the heavy music that loudness does um it's got some of the really up-tempo stuff um it's got a couple of laid back sort of ballady uh songs on there as well um just really really good guitar playing throughout um i mean obviously for me akira has always been a one of the major high points of loudness to begin with and it's it's like it's like no one's telling him no on this album <laughs> he's like <laughs> you know play yeah you want to add another little solo there just go ahead and do it um and while over the years i think that sometimes you know akira can be kind of hit and miss which is an interesting thing but on this album he's like everything's super tasteful um yeah the guitar playing is, is right on the money for me uh and the production is really good you know it's, it's produced by max norman who obviously is a a very capable producer and yeah. The recordings themselves, the individual tracks are just super well recorded, super clear. And then the mix on top of it is just extremely effective. Um, and you get a real feel that the album is laid out in a very uh, purposeful manner. It has a beginning, a middle, an end. You know, the the closing track um, uh, is, is really killer. It leaves you wanting to play the album again. Uh, the Demon Disease, super fast, uh, very loudness, very Akira. Um, yeah, it's one of those albums that, again, back in the day, I didn't appreciate it as much as I probably should have. Um, and now I like it a lot more. It's definitely worth checking out if you're at all into loudness. It's, uh, 
it, it's a really strong outing for them. Yeah, I agree. It's um, I I, I kind of had the same uh, reaction when it came out because it's like my journey with you know loudness was from Law of Devil's Land, and yeah. I was kind of disappointed when they started singing exclusively in English, and then I was really disappointed when they got an American singer. So yeah. I didn't really, I don't think, I mean, I'm sure I listened to the album when it came out and I remember, you know, seeing the video maybe once or twice, but, um, right. I was just kind of wrote it off and I didn't think, uh, Mike's voice really fit with their style very well at the time, but, um, listening to it now, like it, yeah, it's great. It, it fits right in. So it works really well. Yeah. I remember that video. Um, the video song was you shook me, um, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I remember at the time it, it felt kind of cliched and kind of what everybody yeah. else was doing and kind of hair metal -y. but yeah. it's actually a really strong track um, it is. It, it's heavy you know it's it's from that time when i think hair metal or glam or whatever you wanted to call it was still heavy metal <laughs> you know what i mean like uh uh you know the um like shout at the devil and and stuff like that was yeah they've got all that image stuff going on uh, and that's clearly what loudness were trying to and get more and more into it this time but it's still like heavy good music right it, it hadn't really sort of degraded as it uh, eventually did for many bands <laughs> yeah which is interesting because this album came out in 89 you know which is when you know hair metal yeah. really well into like the warrant and poison yeah warrant. exactly exactly and i was really surprised at how heavy this album is it's like okay you're obviously trying to make it in america and be commercial and then you put out like mm -hmm. one of your heavier albums <laughs> yeah it does have a couple of ballady numbers on it. Um, sure. and it's got some more mellow parts, but yeah, overall, it's a very heavy album. Um, and you know, the, the album right after this, um, they, they, they kind of went in a, in a very different way. Yeah. Um, the same singer, obviously they took a very different approach to re-releasing some of their older music. They didn't, you know, one of the things that really between this album and the next one, the one of the huge contrast for me is the production. It just mm. the on the next album is so weird. It just sounds like a bunch of tracks that are laid down together and they're like, okay, done. Let's move on to the next one. Cause it, and it's, you know, not Max Norman, obviously. Um, but yeah, this album very, very strong in, in all, all aspects. One thing that stood out to me was on the song, um, faces in the fire, uh, the bass playing on that. Um, yeah. Uh, Masayoshi Yamashita, I mean, his, he's just like all over the place in that song, like, especially on the verses. Like, it's like this whole just like all over the fretboard. And um, one of the things that uh, I know the band has mentioned Rush as like an influence in the early days. And that's when yeah. I think like back in the day, I was like, Rush didn't sound anything like Rush. But it's like the more I listen right. to their stuff, like especially the more technical aspects, like, yeah, I can definitely hear that. <laughs> It's funny how uh, Rush, you know, based on just from their technical musicianship, I think were a much broader influence on people than what you would expect. Um, they were incredibly, obviously, an incredibly technical band. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I look back at, you know, at Loudness and Akira and all the way back to their uh, lazy days. Um and just what a vast variety of influences uh, they've played through. Um, and and when it all comes together and they can bring it together and sound just like loudness, you know, they don't sound like anybody else. Even the, like the, you know, the 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 rhythm parts of, of the guitar tracks, it's like it's not like they're super complicated. It's not like they're completely like um, unplayable, but they just sound exactly like Akira. <laughs> it's like he's brought it all together and 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 you know, it, it all blends really well. Yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting Claude Chanel played on this. Uh, like, it was like right after, I think it was the same year he quit Dio. That um, is interesting. Yeah. He played the I keyboards. I was expecting when I went back and listened to it to like have, have it have more keyboards because again, that was kind of another thing a lot of bands did when they tried to be a little bit more commercial. But um, there really isn't much on here at all. Like there's a couple of places yeah. that just like emphasize things. But um Right. Yeah, I thought the same thing. I, I was listening to it, and, it, and it, there's a couple places where there's some um, some guitar parts that are either like nicely tapped guitar parts, or they are some interesting keyboard parts. I couldn't really tell in a few places, but I thought the same thing. It's like um, not keyboard heavy at all. For no. one, <laughs> almost, almost like buried in there. 
Yeah, but there's just so many songs on here where you, I mean, you just hear the first riff and you're like, ah, that's loudness. Yep. Yeah. Loudness. <laughs> yeah, and it just kicks right in the first song, the, the um, title track. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was saying with the, uh, you know, the the layout of the, of the album just feels like it's very well crafted. It has a great start, you know, it has some ups and downs in the middle, and then it comes back to the end and, and um, leaves you with a, a, another, like, probably the fastest song in the album. Um, it feels like someone took some time and crafted that whole ordering of it. Yeah. Not like kids today, you know. Kids today. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of us were always good at that. Like they always had those really fast songs towards the end of the albums, like Speed and Esper and uh, Yes, right. <laughs> uh, Demon Disease is definitely, definitely in that same category. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think that's all the comments I had about this. But uh, yeah, let's, let's move on. Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. All right. So my album for this month is the initial solo album by oops jack star out of the darkness um this came out in 1984 i believe yep. and uh he was a guitar player who um from the new york area he started out um he played on the first two virgin steel albums which is another interesting band that's uh gone on and done all kinds of different stuff um right uh i can't remember why they split but um this was his first uh a solo album and it's uh unlike a lot of like 80s guitarist solo albums it's not just a bunch of instrumental tracks you know showing off his skills it's um they're actually songs i mean there's a couple of instrumentals on it but um it's again i think a really well balanced collection of you know some pretty fast heavy songs and then like uh there's a ballad on there and then there's a couple of mid-tempo songs so um but you know, the reason I bought this when it came out was because I was a huge fan of Riot and Red Forrester had just left Riot and this was uh, the first album that um, he, he did um, post that. Um, I think he released his solo album the same year. In fact, it's the same mm -hmm. um, uh, rhythm section. Oh, song. really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Carl Kennedy and I forget the bass player's name, but um, which is also another one I thought about doing for Hidden Gems at some point because... Uh, it's, it's pretty strong. Um, but anyways, uh, getting back to this album. Um, so yeah, the, the, I don't think I would have picked it up based on the cover art because it's got, it looks like maybe a blues album or something. <laughs> like it's yes. very understated. It doesn't look like a metal album at all. Yes. But um, it's actually very like hard rocking and it's a lot of double bass drumming throughout it. Um, it's produced by Carl Kennedy, who is like notorious for like kind of a thin production style. But, um, and it has that, but it's his drumming on it is actually really, really good. Like, um, I didn't realize he was such a good drummer. I'd forgotten no. on this. It also reminds me, the drumming parts remind me of the first Exciter album in a couple of places, you know? Yeah. It's really uh, unexpected. Very cool. Um, so, I mean, there's some songs on here like Concrete Warrior, Chains of Love, um, Eyes of Fire that are all like just really pretty up up tempo and heavy and you know rep forest through his voice is just like one of a kind and he just sounds great on here so if you're a fan at all of um you know riots restless breathe or born in america you should definitely check this out max it's it's kind of in that same vein too like it's it's, yeah. it's definitely heavy and fast and stuff but it's very melodic and um the songs are very uh catchy you know they got catchy choruses and just really well um Put together and the songwriting is just really strong um like for example on the song false messiah which is one of my favorite ones it's kind of a mid-tempo song but in the middle when this for the solo guitar solo part it like really just picks up to this like really fast double bass part that's just killer um there's a couple of instrumental tracks on here uh one's scorcher which is like you know, kind of like uh, Eddie Van Halen, sort of just a Very, show off thing. Yeah. Um, it's kind of cool. And then there's one called Odile, which is more of a kind of a moody, you know, a little bit more melodic. It's got some piano on it. Um, kind of reminds me of like Gary Moore's Frisian Walkways or something. Right. Um, Named after the Jack Star's wife. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't pick up on that. Um, Oh, and there's a great picture on the back too, which I think if they were going to have a picture with Red Forest, there should have been the uh, the cover. Oh yes, 
<laughs> the DeLorean. <laughs> the DeLorean, yeah. Nice. And this has been cool. reissued in recent years on CD with uh, with different cover, a little bit more metal yes. skin cover. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. I prefer I think, the French, the French cover that you found. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, the French. If we're far. lucky, and I use the term very sarcastically uh, to get a very different cover, which I all throw up on the screen here for a brief <laughs> moment. But uh, I'm surprised this hasn't got a repress on vinyl at any point. But maybe I don't think it's like super hard to find still. Like it's, mm. again, it's one of those ones that's kind of a hidden gem. Like I don't think a lot of people are like actively searching for it. So yeah. Um, but they should be. They should they be. Should, they will be. <laughs> they will be after this video. That's right. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, oh, and the, and the, the very last song was is kind of interesting. Let's get crazy again. It's um, it's like this kind of nostalgic lyric, and it's got like more of a seventies like rock and roll, like Slade kind of a, a vibe to it. Yes, it's the kind of thing. Like I, I'm glad the whole album wasn't like that, but yes. it's kind of a fun way to, to end the album. So. Yeah, I thought the same thing. <laughs> Again, just good variety throughout. So. Yeah, yeah, um, and I, I listened to the uh, the German reissue, the, re the recent reissue, which has like double the number of songs. It has this whole set of bonus material at the end, mm. um, none of which fits in with the album at all. It's all just like um, it's 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 interesting and it's good, but it's very Joe Satriani all instrumental um and some of it sounds exactly like joe satriani um yeah well i would much prefer to have the original album for sure um i i found a couple interesting things while um researching it uh you know on on the on the wikipedia page which of course everything there is correct um <laughs> it it credits david defees is that the guy's name De oh, yeah. defees yeah. So the backing vocals not being credited on the album. Huh. So I went to David DeFee's page and on his Wikipedia page, which is much more filled in, um, they give credit to him for producing this album. <laughs> it's really weird. I have to imagine there was some, because it sounds like there was some animosity between he and Jack Starr, perhaps. Um, but yeah, there's something going on there more than meets the eye. Yeah, it's weird because they still they work together after they split in Virgin Steel. But I think there was a brief time when uh, Jack was going to continue with the name Virgin Steel, and they kind of uh, over it for a bit. And that I think, probably butted heads over that. Yeah, um, I thought it was interesting that Jag Panzer um, covered "False Messiah" on one of their albums. That that was interesting. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's vastly inferior because it doesn't have Rhett Forrester singing. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> And Gary Driscoll, um, is that the bass player? Oh no, uh, yeah, he plays drums on. One he plays day. drums on one song, right? Yeah, all the way, all the way back to Ronnie Dio and the Prophets. He was the drummer uh, for Ronnie Dio and the Prophets. Oh wow, I didn't know yeah, that. That's pretty crazy. It's um, funny how like the interconnectedness of that New York scene, like with you know, yes. the, the Rods, Carl Kennedy, and um, Dio's like whole orbit and. Yeah, for sure. And Jack Star too. Um Yeah, for me the big the uh absolute um what sells this album is is Rhett Forrester's voice. Just getting to hear another snippet of Rhett Forrester's voice in the same vein as those classic Riot albums. To me that makes it all worth it. And then Jack Star obviously is a fantastic guitar player. Um and the music you know, it's like you said, the, the production is not, it's, it's there and you can hear it. It's not like a, a super, um, high end recording or anything. It's very, uh, it sounds like, uh, what, uh, the, a lot of the bands that were coming out around that time, uh, sounds very 1984, lots of good material, but yeah, just Rhett Forrester's voice, I thought was, um, it, it made it instantly. I want to listen to this entire album right yeah. away. Um, and Jack Starr's career is interesting too, because he went oh, after yeah. this he formed Burning Star, which they yeah. their first album was like like an attempt to be commercial again and didn't really take off. But then um, they pivoted and like started doing stuff more like this, like a lot heavier, and continued on um, that band. And there's a whole um, 
metal school uh, have done a video about uh, oh, Jack oh. Star's Burning Star. So I'll, okay. I'll link in the uh, description here because that's pretty interesting. He's, he's done a lot over the years with a lot of different people. And it's pretty cool. And he's still out there. Like too. That's, yeah, that's super cool. I like watching those metal school videos where, especially with someone that has such a wide and diverse career, and you aren't going to pick up on all of it just from one source. Uh, right. That's pretty cool. But anyways, yeah, so that is hidden gems for another month. Uh, hopefully we'll get these a little more regularly than uh, we have in recent months. But um, uh, I don't really have a plan for the next one, but um, I'll have to start thinking about some, I'm sure. We'll I've been trying to think of think of ones and yeah. Yeah, but if anyone out there is watching this has some suggestions for like some, you know, rare, unusual, uh, un undiscovered heavy metal albums um, from any era, really. I mean, we yeah from the 80s, 90s, whatever. Um, let us know in comments and just let us know what you think of these albums, if you've heard them, if you check them out. Um, and uh, yeah, until next time, stay metal. <laughs> Rock on.